Good afternoon. I'm Amy Brenner. I'm the director of the CAS Institute. Thank you for joining us today for our session on what ICAST is up to, updates on credentials in data science and predictive analytics, and catastrophe risk management. With me today, I have three people who are very involved in the CAS Institute. Immediately to my left is Joanne Spala, who is a fellow of the CAS and a member of the American Academy of Actuaries and is a long-standing, long-time CAS volunteer. She has served on the CAS Board and Executive Council as Vice President Marketing and Communications. As you heard on Monday, she was recently appointed President of the CAS Institute. When she is not volunteering, she works as an independent consultant in Stamford, Connecticut. To Joanne's left is Todd Lehman, FCAS, CSPA, MAAA, CPCU. He's Vice President and Chief Actuary at Quincy Mutual Fire Insurance. He received his FCAS in 2001, and he chairs the Subject Matter Expert Committee for the Predictive Analytics Data Science Credential and is the chair of the Project Committee. As most of you heard on Monday, he was awarded the CAS Above and Beyond Volunteer Award. Prior to becoming Chief Actuary at Quincy Mutual, he was in charge of research and analytics at One Beacon from 2008 to 2016. To Todd's left is Steve Mildenhall, Assistant Professor of Risk Management and Director of Insurance Data Analytics at the School of Risk Management in the Tobin College of Business at St. John's University. Steve has 25 years experience in the insurance industry. Prior to joining St. John's in 2016, he was global CEO of analytics for Aon PLC based in Singapore and head of Aon Benfield Analytics. He helped found and establish Aon Singapore Center for Innovation and Analytics. He was a member of the subject matter expert group for the predictive analytics and data science credential and was instrumental in the development of the CAT risk credentials he will be discussing. He was recently elected to the CAS board. Today we're here to talk about where ICAS is, where we've been, and where we're going. And to start us off, I'd like to invite Joanne Spall. I'm going to try something a little different. Um, first of all, I don't know if it's on. I was afraid you wouldn't be able to see me if I stood behind the podium. Um, it's a rather large podium. So um, on our agenda today is to give you a little bit of background on the CAS Institute and then talk about the requirements for our two credentials. Um, there are two CAT credentials that we're going to talk about and the requirements for the Certified Specialist in Predictive Analytics credential. Um, we'll talk about the timeline and some things that are coming up and then talk about the membership and practice community that we've built over the last year. And then we're going to leave plenty of time for um, questions so you can find out what you want to know about the credentials. Um, in case you don't know, the CIS Institute is a wholly owned subsidiary of the Casualty Actuarial S Society. It's also known as ICAS among us. Um, and it was designed to provide specialist credentials and resources for quantitative professionals in selected areas. Um, this is an example of the areas that we visualized when we first created ICAS. Um, we've already worked on the predictive analytics and um, catastrophe credentials, but we also had in mind down the road doing credentials in some of these other areas like quantitative reinsurance, capital modeling, ORSA, and perhaps other areas. When the CAS board was doing its environmental scanning, they recognized that there was a demand in the marketplace for quantitative professionals. Um, their um, ones that we are most familiar with was predictive analytics, and the boards talked a lot about that. And they saw that there was a need to serve um, these professionals. They don't, a lot of them, like um, 
predictive analytics, there really isn't a, a single credential um, for them. And we saw that there would be a need. We also saw that professionals in these fields had a need for a community of practice with one another. They made it a subsidiary because they wanted to allow the CIS to continue in its specialty of actuarial credentials in P&C insurance, but they wanted to have a separate subsidiary that was unrestricted that could go beyond traditional P&C insurance. So that was the reasoning for forming ICAS a couple of years ago. We think that there's, in the marketplace, there's a lot of value that these credentials will provide for the professionals. It recognizes their expertise and knowledge, and um, it recognizes that they're working in a specialized industry, and we wanted to give them practical and on-the-job skills. So it was designed to not be a theoretical um, type of credential or an advanced degree. It was really focusing on practical applications and we thought by offering these credentials we could allow the people that held them to um, be recognized with their current employers as well as prospective employers because we talk to a lot of employers and they say they have a hard time hiring people in these specialties. You know, they can look at somebody's resume and see the courses they've taken, but they really don't know what they can do and whether they can come into a job, especially in a specialized field like insurance, and um, be productive right from the beginning. And then it would allow people that maybe had a traditional career path, like an actuary, to expand in other areas. A lot of actuaries that went through the exams years ago didn't have training in things like predictive analytics. So it would allow them to um, continue to gain the knowledge and advance their career. Another thing we heard from employers that when they hire non-actuaries for these jobs, they don't have the same career path as their actuarial colleagues. Leagues. And as a result, they feel like the company maybe doesn't have support for them in advancing their career. And by offering a credential that the company could support, they might be able to retain them longer after they've made a big investment in their training. We also wanted to provide a community that we'll talk about later so these people could interact and learn with, from one another. Um, as an independent um, subsidiary of the, of the CIS, when it was first created, um, ICAS um, didn't have its own board. It um, reported to the CIS board of directors, and it was run by a leadership advisory committee. We've recognized now, it's been almost three years since the idea was conceived, that um, we wanted to evolve the organizational structure of the CAS Institute, and the board recognized that it should operate more like a startup company rather than an established association. So the board recently approved a proposal to um, change the governance structure, and the CAS Institute will have its own board of directors. It'll have three directors that are appointed by the CAS board, and it will have other members, including Amy, and they appointed um, the first ICAS president, and I was happy that they selected me for that job. Um, like other organizations' credentials, um, and similar to the CAS credentials, um, candidates for the ICAS credential are going to follow a, a course of study. Um, a lot of it is all self-study um, with specific learning objectives. It's going to have a much narrower focus um, than traditional CAS credentials, and it's going to be overseen by a panel of specialists, including people like Todd and, and Steve, and they're going to establish the eligibility requirement. They've created the credential and the educational material and what the competency level is to attain the credentials. 
They also evaluate something called experienced practitioners. We recognize when you create a new credential, you won't have a body of people to work on the credential unless you have a way of admitting people that are um, established professionals in the field. So we um, start each credential with an experienced practitioner pathway. And Amy's going to talk about that a little bit in her presentation. I mentioned that it's less comprehensive than the traditional actuarial credentials. It doesn't cover as broad a range of topics, but instead it takes a much deeper dive into the specialization. Um, so we anticipate that it's going to take less time for someone to complete the credentials. Uh, FCAS is seven to ten years, and we're looking at something that's um, more like one to three years, depending on how much knowledge you bring when you come into the process. And it's also less of a time commitment than going from a master's degree and a PhD, and it's more flexible in that you can um, study for it on your own time um, rather than having to, you know, go to a um, university or even to do it online. So we hope that that's um, going to make it much more attractive. Um, we're excited that we've offered um, two sets of credentials. Um, Amy's going to talk about the newest one uh, in catastrophe risk management, and then Todd's going to talk about the certified specialist in predictive analytics. And I'm going to turn it over to Amy. Actually, we co-opted Steve. Oh, yeah, that's right. You're going to do this. Start at this slide, yeah. So, uh, is, is there anyone here who works in CAT modeling? Whoa, a half. No, one, and a, one and a half. All right. Okay, so I'm guessing there's nobody here who's heard of the ISCM. Has anyone heard of the ISCM? I have. Well, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, I'd worked in uh, CAT modeling, and you know, I, when I was at AM Benfield, it was, CAT was the big thing, right? Doing uh, CAT programs. And um, Dan Dick, who is, uh, you'll, you'll see his name later on, is a, is a, I think he's a past president of the ISCM. And uh, he ran the, the CAT practice at, uh, at AM Benfield. And he would always disappear in great meetings at convenient times of the year. Like in, in, in February, I think, there was always a meeting in Florida where he would go and, and to discuss CAT models, and it all sounded great. And I never really knew what it was all about, but it seemed legit, you know, signed the expense reports and everything. Um, well, it turned out it was this ISCM, it's the International Society of Catastrophe Managers, which is a, a, a very international body of catastrophe managers, right? It's, it's the sort of the cap modeling society. They had their major meeting was, um, this meeting in, in Florida was in conjunction with the Reinsurance Association of America, um, and they would put on a lot of uh, uh, sessions, uh, education around cap modeling, um, comparing and contrasting the different CAP models, strengths and weaknesses, model changes, all that sort of thing. Um, so in, I guess, at the end of 15, I think it was, 2015, when I'd been working with Todd on the CSPA, uh, Bob Nicholas said to me, well, the next one we want to do is CAP modeling. And I was like, great, I think that's it. You know, it won't be as big as, as uh, predictive analytics, obviously, it's a smaller group. But I knew from uh, dealing with the CAT modelers at, at uh, Aon, there was, a, there was a definite need here that we could fill. So I was talking to, to Dan about it, and I said, you know, we need to figure out a syllabus. And he more or less like, pulled out of his jacket pocket. He said, we've got a syllabus already. Here it is. I'm the um, chief education officer for the ISCM. We've given this a lot of thought. And you know, we think a lot of old, we know what the, the exams uh, and uh, the, the syllabus should cover. And I sort of given it some separate thought, and we had a lot of overlap between, uh, between the two. And so th this is sort of the, the genesis of this. I went back to Bob, and I said, you know, hey, there's this group by SCM. We should definitely be working with them. Um, they've they've uh, put a lot of effort into this already. And um, so we then sort of started through uh, 16 and, and 17 to, to sort of work together and, and uh, fine tune what we had. It was a little bit of a Stokes mating dance to get the two uh, organizations to, to actually work together. But where we are today is a result of that kind of joint process. 
Um, the I think the ISCM is sort of I don't know about a thousand members, something of, of that order of magnitude. It's a membership organization, though. You can go right now and pay your fifty bucks, and you become a member. It's not a credentialing organization. It doesn't certify anyone. It's not an educational, uh, explicit sort of like the the CAS with uh, with different credential levels. So this was a departure both for 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 them and, and an opportunity to to work with the uh, to work with the ICAS. So the structure that we've got, sorry, look like the structure that we've got is that the, the two organizations have joint control over the syllabus and the materials that are going to go into it. Um, so the approval authority rests at that uh, kind of top level. We've got an advisory committee that sort of filters things up uh, to the uh, top group for, for approval. And then as always, all the work is done down at the bottom level uh, with the subject matter uh, expert groups. Um, who are, are fleshing out the, the syllabus and then working with the institutes the same way we did with the CSPA to actually produce the textbooks and then craft the exams and so forth. So I'll go through, um, so this is, this is what we uh, just described. Um, the, in terms of the names that are involved, um, you know, the, the team on the ICAS side is uh, Bob and then Al Beer, who coincidentally is also at St. John's, is a past president of the, of the CAS. Uh, Han Hans, uh, Amy and, and Joanna, and then the uh, ISCM folks, some of you may know on the left there. Um, it's Min Chong Mao, who's uh, listed down as the secretary, I think is no longer actually the secretary, but she is an actuary as well. So we, there is actuarial representation within the ISCM already, there's a certain amount of overlap uh, between the two organizations there as well. And then you see Dan there as the uh, education uh, committee chair. So, as you take the exams, um, we're actually, this was a bit of a debate um, between the organizations as how we should structure it. When did you have to join which organization? The way we've set it up is that the catchment for uh, the target audience for the exams is, is anybody who's uh, you know, potentially a member of either organization. But once you get the credential, we're going to require that you're going to be a member of both organizations. And there's, there's benefits that we know about on the ICAS side in terms of community of practice and, and what have you. There's also benefits on the ISCM side in terms of getting access to their meetings and their other educational offerings. So um, eventually, uh, everybody who gets this credential would be a member of both of these organizations. In terms of the uh, credential, we're envisaging um, a two-tier credential. Um, in part, this is because um, we, we, we want this to be something that facilitates um, sort of career progression for catastrophe modelers. So envisaging that a new person coming in starting at the bottom level, we didn't want it to be a, a sort of four to five year step before they got to anything. So it's a kind of like an associate and a fellowship level. Um, the names I don't think have quite been firmed up yet. They are firmed up. They are, so firmed, it, and they are now, so, yes. <laughs> so it's going to be a, a certified catastrophe risk specialist and a, a certified catastrophe risk management professional with the, the two different levels. Um, and then the exams uh, that we have, it's the, the, um, the second tier is basically going to be everything we have in the first tier, only more, right? So we'll do more perils, more depth, uh, and, and so forth. Um, for the first level of, of um, uh, certification, you understand the basics of what you're doing, you can run a CAMP model, you, you understand uh, the components of the CAMP model, you can explain the output, you can do a certain amount of the math that uh, needs to be done with that type of output. You understand the, the data issues that come in, how you manage that. Um, and then the second tier is just going to take all of those um, uh, requirements and kind of move them up to the, up to the next level. So in terms of the exams, um, we've got the first two exams are largely common with the CSPA. So we've got the ethics exam, which I think is completely common. Um, and then it was very important that we had the insurance fundamentals. Um, we, could, we were able to strip out some of the sort of liability coverage type uh, items that are covered on the uh, CSPA exam and, and focus it more on the catastrophe risk piece. The books for this are already done. They look uh, spectacular. So I don't know if you've seen the, the institutes puts these great books together. From a student's perspective, they're very nice because unlike you know, actuarial exams where it's a bunch of papers, they sort of look cohesive, um, same sort of titling and subtitling and so forth. So this has been put together in, in conjunction uh, with the institutes. 
Then we get into the, the CAT modeling proper. So there's going to be a basic CAT modeling uh, exam that will look into how you model um, the hazard and the vulnerability. So I don't know if you're familiar with CAT modeling, but you model the hazard, which is sort of generating the events or simulating the hurricanes, um, the vulnerability of each exposure that you have, exposure information, and then you overlay a financial model, which, pu which puts the insurance terms and conditions basically on the loss. So you, you generate a, a damage ratio on a property, you, uh, that generates a, a, a sort of economic loss, and then you run that through the insurance uh, contracts, and then you aggregate all that information to get your model goals. So the, the cap, basic CAP modeling kind of follows that uh, sort of four-step process to, to get to um, the, the CAP model output. And then there's some sort of unique statistics um, around computing sort of PMLs and value at risk, tail value at risk, AALs, impact of reinsurance structures, layering losses, and so forth as part of the statistics. And then the database management components. Um, these things are very data intensive, the input, data sets can be you know hundreds of megabytes the output data sets can be gigabytes because you can often generate you know tens of thousands of simulations for each input policy and then you can have you know literally millions of policies if it's a big personal account. so there's a pretty heavy uh, data um, component to this i don't think we're having quite as much fun as that i don't know what they're watching over there but playing uh, video games or something but um the second level then um is is as i said it's going to be more perils um, more in depth in terms of the uh, components of the, the model uh, design and construction um, and then a better understanding of what you do with the output and how it sort of fits into a, a business context. Um, one thing that they've been aware of here is this should be a very international offering. Um, so the ISCM currently has training that they offer in Bermuda, London and Zurich and possibly Asia, I'm not sure, but definitely Bermuda, London and Zurich. There's a lot of CAT modelers in each of those locations, and so we were very conscious as we were putting the syllabus together to make sure it wasn't just a US focus, that it was really uh, having a global focus. All right, I think that's over to you. Okay. EPP. Thank you, Steve. <clears throat> we had an experienced practitioner pathway for the certified specialist in predictive analytics credential that Todd is going to talk about. We have about 225 or 230 people so far who have earned the credential through the experienced practitioner pathway. And we are close to finalizing the requirements for the experienced practitioner pathway for the higher of the two CAT credentials, the, um, the CCRMP. And in fact, Joanne and I have an in-person meeting with the ISCM people later this week in Connecticut to hopefully nail that down. The process will be uh, filling out an application that shows that you have mastered uh, many, the required subject matter. And it would obviously be the subject matter of both tiers because this is going to be the higher level credential. And we will ask for specific examples of work that you have done you have to provide references who can confirm the information that you've given us. And it will be reviewed by the advisory committee or the education committee and other experienced practitioners, depending on whom it's delegated to. And then it will ultimately be approved by the advisory committee. This is not that different from the way we did the experienced practitioner pathway for the CSPA. And speaking of the CSPA, I'm going to invite Todd up. Thank you, Amy. So uh, I think I might move around a little bit. Uh, so if no one's here, well, a couple people are here for the uh, cat management credential. Uh, I assume most people are here to learn about ICAS or to learn about the, uh, the data science credential. A um, little bit of background on the, the, the data science credential. Uh, back in uh, I don't know, several years ago, uh, <clears throat> I was running a, a research team and uh, talking about the, the value that we had as predictive modelers to the insurance enterprise. And CEO came to me and said, you know, you guys are doing great work. 
we'd like to see more. Um, and we'd like to take your team of three and make it eight, make it 12. Uh, and so, you know, I think uh, other people, other managers uh, in my position uh, have been in similar positions where they've been asked to uh, expand their teams uh, of data scientists, of uh, predictive modelers. Uh, I, I chose to expand with both actuaries and non-actuaries. I felt like the, the, the partnership, uh, the differences of opinions were, were substantial and, and uh, relevant and mutually beneficial. So, uh, so I grew my team both with uh, actuarial students and with uh, non-actuaries. Non-actuaries came from a variety of different backgrounds. Uh, the ones that I thought worked out the best and not everybody did work out uh, were people that came from a quantitative discipline. Um, there, one person had a, a, a degree in environmental biology uh, and had written a number of papers on fish populations and pollution. Uh, and so he knew the, the statistics and, and uh, was familiar with SAS and, and uh, uh, and could communicate the, the material pretty well, and uh, very well actually. And uh, so we, uh, um, what was missing though was, uh, you know, some sort of, uh, you know, vetting or some sort of, if there was a credential or some sort of uh, standardized set of knowledge that we could use to help train the people that came from uh, other industries, that, that would really be ideal. And it turns out after talking to other people in similar positions that a lot of people had that same issue. And so uh, around the same time, Bob was talking about ICAS and creating this, uh, this initiative. And uh, you know, data science was uh, uh, certainly an area where um, we thought that um, it made sense to develop a credential um, and, uh, uh, and get it off the ground. Uh, and luckily, uh, there were a number of CAS uh, leaders and, and uh, thought leaders or uh, um, diligent uh, authors and, and uh, frequent speakers at CAS events, uh, like Steve, uh, who, who uh, were passionate about the subject and wanted to see this get off the ground. And so we created a subject matter expert group uh, to basically build the framework around the exam. And by and large, it, it kind of it, you know, evolved over time, but it, the structure that we came up with is basically what, what we have. Uh, so the CSPA credential is uh, it's a certified specialist in predictive analytics. Uh, we, we welcome non-actuaries to, to this uh, community. Um, the, uh, to earn the credential, uh, it's not as rigorous as what you see with the CAS exams in terms of the time. It may be a deeper dive, though, in some of the areas that uh, are, are not, at, not covered as fully in uh, the modern actuarial statistics uh, syllabus. Um, we're also focusing on you know, practical modeling. And so this designation is really geared towards somebody that's doing the modeling, somebody that's, um, that's building models and uh, going, getting data, looking at the data, evaluating the data, running the models, writing the code for it, and producing the output. So why do we, why do we offer this? Um, I talked a little bit about uh, you know, where we were, uh, where I was in that journey. Uh, but, but by and large, at, across the industry, there were employers that, that that saw a need for some sort of credentialing or some sort of training for data scientists. Um, the, there's an employer's advisory council uh, that the CAS uh, gets opinions from, from time to, you know, on a regular basis, and they uh, conveyed this, this information to uh, the ICAS folks and to the CAS that you know, they, want, uh, they want to have some sort of credentialing, some sort of training for their data scientists. Um, at the same time, you have actuaries that want to do more with data science. They may not have, I mean, when I took the exams, we didn't, we didn't, we, we did not have modern actuarial statistics. We, we knew um, statistics, but we, didn't, we weren't trained on GLMs, um, and we weren't trained on, certainly on machine learning 
techniques and how do you evaluate that, how do you run that. Um, writing code wasn't part of the actuarial exams. So um, <clears throat> we thought that you know, we, we would put this body of knowledge in, in a rigorous format and, uh, and create the credential. So the, uh, there's five components of the CSPA through, uh, through, uh, through the uh, examination process. Uh, the first component is uh, a domain-specific component, so property casualty insurance. Um, we've made this modular on purpose so that we could start to offer uh, exam ones for other domains as, uh, as the need arises. And uh, certainly, I think, you know, we, throughout all this, uh, Steve talked about it, the, the partnership between the ISCM and the ICAS. Uh, there were, there are partnerships with, uh, there was a partnership with the Insurance Data Management Association uh, to create exam two. And uh, those types of partnerships are, are a critical part of ICAS. We've leveraged that as best we could. Um, and that collaborative spirit uh, hopefully we'll continue with uh, maybe work with uh, the SOA to develop uh, domain uh, areas uh, on the life and health side. Uh, but for now, we have the property casualty insurance fundamentals as the first domain. The next exam is on data concepts and visualization. <coughs> the third exam is on predictive modeling uh, techniques and methods. Uh, we added uh, something different. To this, uh, to this process. We wanted to have a case study where uh, after you take the exams, you would have a chance to show what you, what you learned and demonstrate the techniques that you were uh, tested on in the exams. And so we've created a case study uh, to do just that. Uh, and then lastly, uh, but very important, uh, there's a, an ethics component to gaining this credential and there's an online course on ethics and professionalism that you would take. So deep, we'll dig a little bit deeper into the specifics for exam one. Uh, by the way, has anyone taken exam one here? Has anyone thought about taking? Well, I would expect that there wouldn't be too many because uh, you get a waiver for exam one if you're a fellow <laughs> or an associate. Uh, but. Uh, <clears throat> exam one basically covers uh, what uh, synthesizes online courses one and two and takes some pieces from the exam five on rate making and reserving. Uh, and really what we were trying to do here is if you're new to insurance, uh, but you may you had uh, experience building models and maybe experience with the data structures, um, what kind of things do you need to know if you're going to be building um, models? And we thought that there, there did need to be a piece uh, that wasn't in online one and two that uh, covered rate making um, and, and also reserving. So we added that to this exam. And uh, essentially we're covering, you know, uh, insurance company operations from uh, online one and then uh, policy analysis coverages and uh, exposure factors, uh, regulation uh, from online two. The second exam uh, is on data concepts and digitalization. And this was one uh, that we did partner with IDMA uh, to develop the, uh, some of the material and, and, uh, and we got their input on what we were testing. This one's a three hour exam with multiple choice questions and it will be offered four times a year. The, uh, to the topics, looking at the data sources, external, internal, uh, how do you access data, uh, using data, data quality, um, how, how is, uh, how do, what kind of um, things do we use data for in insurance, uh, talking about regulations, there's uh, some coverage of data tools including uh, SQL, uh, data exploration, and then some basics into um, uh, how do you display and do multi univariate analysis, multivariate analysis, and visualization? Um, again, this is an uh, this is a multiple choice exam, and uh, so you 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 may be shown uh, concepts, and you would uh, you know answer within the multiple choice framework. So it's 
it's a little bit, it's not like the CAS exams where you're short answer and, and such. Exam three is short answer in, in the sense that, uh, or uh, in the sense of uh, what we think of with the actuarial exams. But it's also given uh, on, on, uh, uh, on the computer. So it's a computer-based exam in the framework uh, that, that also was used for um, the TBE exams for CAS. Uh, the plan with, with uh, exam three and uh, using true ability as the environment uh, was basically to uh, put R and R Studio in, uh, in this environment where the candidates would go into the environment, write code, and answer the questions. Um, it, they have four hours to do the, the coding and answering the questions, and it will be offered two times a year. So I'm gonna pause for a second. This one's kind of new, so uh, we just offered it for the first time uh, this fall. Um, we didn't have many people take it, uh, but we, we understand that there are a number of people that are ready to take it. Uh, I think they didn't want to be the first, the first to, uh, to, to give it a try. Um, uh, any questions about exam three, the process? Sure. Could you, could you go, to, go to the mic? Because we're being, thanks. There's obviously a lot of concerns with the exam five being done online. Is there any concerns, I guess, using that here as well? Uh, there, there were some concerns, I think, initially. We, um, I think, as this evolved, when we decided to create exam three and make it a predictive analytics exam, we knew that we did not want to do paper and pencil. And so uh, I, the ICAST folks and Amy uh, in particular deserves uh, all the credit uh, to uh, you know, basically identifying true ability as a vendor and, uh, and setting up those initial contacts. And uh, I think the CES was very excited about that initiative and, and did a lot with it uh, on, their, on their side. Um, but the intention was to never do remote proctoring. Uh, I think we had always intended to have the true ability on computers in, uh, in a testing environment uh, similar to like the program metrics um, where there are proctors, where, where it is supervised in, in, in an environment like that. And the problems with exam five were because of the remote proctoring, not the true, true ability um, platform. Um, you know, that, that said, I think TrueAbility is, um, they're, they're a good partner uh, uh, for us. Uh, there have been, uh, you know, there were issues, obviously there are technical issues when you create an environment like that. It doesn't always work uh, right the first time. And so we've had a, a good dialogue and a good process of uh, identifying issues, uh, having those issues uh, addressed by TrueAbility and then uh, getting things fixed. Um, the first set of candidates taking exam three gave us extensive feedback, uh, so which we certainly appreciated. Uh, and we've uh, done our best to incorporate that into uh, things that are similar on the project, uh, but also getting ready for the, the next sitting of exam three. So what is covered on exam three? Initially, we, we wanted to cover, you know, the predictive modeling tools and, and validation and how you do these things. And it was kind of theoretical, uh, just talking about that, like different techniques and machine learning and uh, GLMs. And um, so we, we actually gave it some thought and, and decided to structure the, the syllabus of the exam uh, along the lines of the way that you would actually build a model. Uh, and so that's, uh, that's the structure. Uh, of the syllabus, identifying the business problem, what are the issues associated with that, designing the model, prepping the data, selecting features, choosing the model, interpreting output, and sharing the output. So all those, all those steps uh, are typically how you, what, you, what you would go through in building a model, and uh, the syllabus is structured towards that to, uh, to be more practical and, and helpful to uh, uh, to our candidates. 
The fourth component is the case study, and we're getting ready to roll that out. Um, the case study basically uh, covers uh, everything from the domain, things that you would need to know from the domain exam, things that you have to know from the data exam, uh, and uh, the modeling exam. Uh, the candidates are given um, a specific business problem to solve and a set of data. That data that they're given is unique to each candidate. Now, basic, in, in, in essence, what we're doing is we have a population set of data and we're randomizing chunks of that data, records of those data, and those that randomized data is given to individual candidates. So everyone has a slightly different data set uh, pulled from the same source data. The, um, there are specific projects uh, as part of, or specific um, subject areas as part of the project. So the, the first uh, uh, case study is in the uh, pricing rate making uh, arena. We've developed uh, an operational model. We're working on claims models and marketing models. <clears throat> so the, the idea would be that uh, you're assigned a, a specific business problem and then you would use uh, the techniques and tools and uh, knowledge that are tested in the first three exams to build, the, to build your report and then submit the report. Um, uh, if you want to go back one, yep. Sorry. One more, yeah. Thanks. So the the project itself is a sixty day uh, time period. The um, so each candidate has sixty days to complete the project. The uh, environment is the true ability environment, but they have access to SAS, SPSS, R, R Studio. Uh, Python, we're adding uh, H2O flow uh, to that. And uh, certainly, um, you know, as other uh, tools uh, become more prevalent and used, then we would consider adding those as well. We're trying to make this as uh, real world as possible. So you know, if, you, if you like to use a certain, uh, if somebody likes to use Python, they can use Python. Somebody wants to use SAS, that's what they use at work. They can use SAS, and um, and it is it is within, done within a certain environment. So you can't take the within the true ability environment. You don't have the ability to take the data from true ability, download it, and then do things with it. Uh, it, it all has to be done within the true ability environment, and we've uh, we've tested it so that you can't take the data and and pull it out and just do whatever you want with it. Um, the project report that's put together is um, geared towards, you know, how do you document, how are you documenting your work, your findings, and then what results do you have and how are you going to present that in a business case. Okay. Any questions about the project? Okay, um, the last piece of the CSPA credential is the ethics assessment. And uh, the ethic, ethics assessment uh, doesn't have a fee. Uh, the first four components, the three exams and the case study, all have an exam fee. This one's for free. Uh, anyone can take it. Uh, you just have to be a member of ICAS. No, anyone can take it. And with that, I'll pass. Uh, I'll answer any questions if you have them. All right, thank you. Thanks, Josh. The Continuing Education Committee just finalized the continuing education requirements. And the requirements are 60 units of CE that's relevant to the practice of predictive analytics or data science in whatever, in whatever industry the credential holder is. 
and it's every two years. Ten of these units or more must be structured according to the, uh, the way the CIS requires structure or the way the academy requires structure. Thirty units have to be in ethics and professionalism, data management, and predictive analytics and modeling techniques in the number of units that uh, you see in front of you, 6, 4, and 20 respectively. And we're saying units because for the CAS, a, a CPD hour is 50 minutes. But for example, for the CIA, for the Canadian uh, Actuarial Society, it is 60 minutes. And so that's why we're saying units. 30 elective units may be from any of the six content areas with certain restrictions. You can have up to, you can count up to 15 units of industry knowledge, up to six units in relevant business oriented skills, such as communication. And you cannot use the business oriented skills courses to fulfill the structured hours requirement. In other words, we want your structured hours to be credential specific. This would apply to all CSPA credential holders, and you have two years, two, full, two, two years after you receive the credential. So for example, if you receive the credential July 15, 2018, you have until December 31st, 2020. So you have a minimum of two years, but in some cases it could be close to three years depending on where, when in the year you receive your credential. And we're doing that to make it easier for us to track the CE hours. Plus, as actuaries, you submit your CE hours, your CPD hours, as of December 31st as well. The six content areas are ethics and professionalism, data management techniques, predictive analytics modeling techniques, industry knowledge, business skills, and any other relevant skills. Any questions on this? Uh, Brian Brown mentioned on Monday that we now have almost 400 paid members of the CAS Institute. We're very excited about that because we've only been around for a couple of years. 40% of our members and about 40% of our credential holders are non-actuaries. We have a lot of people who hold the CPCU credential who have pursued this, and we have a lot of people who are data scientists without an insurance credential, but who've been working in insurance for many years who hold the credential. Our members work at over 200 companies and are in 10 countries. And we've awarded over 200 CSPAs through the Experienced Practitioner Pathway. And this coming March at RPM, which is when we recognize the people who have achieved the credential, we will hopefully be recognizing our first credential holders who will have achieved the credential through the examination process. We've had 97 people enroll in, in the first course in the Property and Casualty Fundamentals course. So these are non-actuaries or non-CPCU holders. These are people who have no credential at all in insurance and have less than five years experience. So that's very exciting to me that 41 people who don't come really with an insurance background have taken this. We created PC2 for people who have the CPCU designation or people who have taken CAS online one and two but haven't yet passed exam five. And all that is is an online module that takes the pieces from exam five that we've rolled into our first course. It didn't make sense for people to have to retest on material that they had already studied and passed. And so we created this mini course that does not have an outside exam. It just has built-in knowledge checks. And we've had um, 32 people, it looks like, uh, enroll and 21 complete that. The data exam has had 187 people enrolled and 93 people have taken the past exams. And these 93 people, the ones who have passed out of those 93 are the ones who then would be eligible to take 
uh, what we're calling DS2, which is the, uh, the second, the um, predictive modeling methods and techniques exam. And that will be offered again on March 7th. And then the project will be offered sometime within the next couple of weeks that will open up for the people who have passed the third exam. And Joanne is going to talk a little bit about ICAS and the ICAS community. ICAS is more than um, just credentials. We also wanted to offer membership in a community of practice for people who may not take the credentials. They might have experience and don't feel like they need to take the credential to their career, but they would like to communicate with other um, professionals that s share similar interests. So ICAS membership is open to anyone that wants to belong to it. Um, it's required for certain credential holders, like before you get the credential, you have to be a member. And to register for the third exam, you also have to be a member of ICAS. And that's because we have a set of ethical principles for professionals that people that hold the credential as well as people who are members agree to follow that. So we wanted people to be a member by the time they took the third exam. Annual dues are very reasonable, only $250 a year. Um, and with that, you get uh, a number of benefits. On the next slide, you can see um, this is a view of the um, membership practice community. Uh, when you pay for your membership, you're a member of this community and you have access to some members only features, one of which is uh, a database um, addresses and email addresses and information on other practicing professionals so it's searchable. We use the same platform, you probably recognize it, that the CAS online community uses, but we have a unique community for ICAS members. In addition, it has a calendar of events, and then it has a discussion forum feature. And we've already launched that, and it, you can see there's some activity in it already. We had an online study group for part three. We had discussion groups. There's a book club. Um, everyone um, knows the CAS um, research actuary, um, his name is Brian Fannin, um, he's leading a discussion of a predictive analytics book. We had a Q&A with an author, Dan Airely, I think his name is, um, that he um, wrote a book, Predictively Irrational, and we had a discussion group where people posed questions and then he responded via an audio file. Um, so there's a lot of potential for the online community and we encourage people to join. Another aspect of the community is continuing education, and we offer a number of continuing education opportunities for ICAS members. The big event for people in predictive analytics is our community of practice event, which is held the day before um, the CIS RPM seminar, which is gonna be in Boston, I believe. And um, then you can also attain, uh, attend the CAS RPM following that. But that workshop day, we have a session that's all devoted to ICAS members. We also offer the CAS discount. If you're not a CAS member, you get the CAS member rate for all CAS meetings. We offer webinars, and we're gonna continue to offer opportunities. We hope to have a webinar series. So that's another benefit of membership. Um, the next slide just shows um, the timeline, um, past events, as we've talked about. We've really accomplished a lot in the past two to three years. Um, we now offer exams one, two, and three, and are about to offer the project. The second sitting of exam three, for those people who were afraid to take it the first time around, is gonna be offered in March. Um, the project is opening up as we said soon, the first CAT um, exam is open already, and then in 2019, we're going to have the second um, CAT management exam and the introduction to catastrophe modeling. So there's a lot of activity on the horizon, and we hope to expand beyond PNC insurance to other countries as well as to 
um, other domains. So we're really excited and we hope um, you'll be interested. There's more ways to um, continue to follow us. Um, next slide, I think, has. Um, we have the casinstitute.org website. If you don't want to become a member right away, you can sign up to be on our email list. We're also on social media, both LinkedIn and Twitter, and you can follow us there and get the latest update. We have a site just for the CAT credential as well. And um, if you don't have this written down, if you look in the bags that you got when you checked in, we have two flyers in there, one for the predictive analytics and one for the CAT credential, where you can see an outline of each of the credential requirements. So we're really excited, and I think we have about 15 minutes for questions. Someone has to have a question. Let me, th oh great, we have a question. Are you uh, planning on hosting webinars to uh, support the continuing education requirements? The answer is yes. We're hoping to <clears throat> have a quarterly webinar series. And one of the things I meant to mention when we talked about continuing education is that if you attend a CAS meeting, and you attend a session that would fulfill requirements for both your uh, CAS credential and the CSPA, you can count it for both purposes. So you don't have to double the number of CE hours you earn as long as it meets the relevancy requirements for both. So the answer is yes, we're hoping for quarterly, uh, quarterly webinars. Are there continuing education requirements uh, necessary for the catastrophe risk management route uh, as well? There will be. They haven't been developed yet, but they, there absolutely will be. We feel you have to be current in the fields in order to really uh, uh, show that you are keeping up with what's going on and, and uh, <clears throat> continuing trends. And one of the things I wanted to mention about the CAT credential is that it's platform agnostic. Some of the modeling companies offer their own credentials, but that's specific to their credentials. And we actually have participation from the three largest CAT modeling companies, uh, CoreLogic, RMS, and AIR. So we're very excited that they are supporting our effort as well. We're also looking for volunteers when you mentioned the webinar series. We're going to be forming a continuing education committee that would um, put together those seminars that would interest the members. So if you're interested in volunteering to either work on the exams, the credentials, continuing ed, or the practice community, please come see Amy or me. Um, we can give you more information because we want the community to be run by the volunteers. Yeah, definitely. I think uh, one, one uh, thing to point out is that uh, a lot of this has been developed by people that were passionate about predictive analytics like the CSPA. Uh, certainly on the, the CAT management side, uh, the association is full of people that are very, uh, very passionate about CAT modeling. Um, and some, sometimes I get the question, what if my company isn't supporting ICAS? What if they have their own, like a number of, a number of the large PNC companies have their own uh, in-house training for predictive analytics? And I would say, you know, we don't mean to compete. We're not trying to compete. We're trying to collaborate. And, uh, you know, if, if your company does have its own training, uh, it's, there still may be benefits to, to joining uh, ICAS, joining the community of practice of predictive analytics, uh, because there are things that are happening outside, outside uh, every company. Uh, and and uh, I think uh, building, those, building that network uh, is one of the benefits with ICAS. And also, if you think your um, employer would be interested in learning more about our credential, um, if you have colleagues that are interested, we do go out and visit companies, and we'd be happy to come to your company and talk to your management about the credential. If you're active in a regional affiliate, we'd love to come out. Uh, again, just contact Amy or me. Any additional questions? What did I want to talk about? 
if you're interested in looking at some of the books, some of the materials, uh, I have a couple of them up here. In addition, there's an ICAST booth, and I'll be there at least through breakfast tomorrow before I have to pack up and catch a plane. Uh, sign up for our mailing list if you don't if you're not already a member of ICAS or if you don't already receive our periodic emails so that you can keep up with what's going on with the credentials. We're really excited about ICAS. It's a priority of the CAS and we expect to be growing very quickly. We encourage your participation and especially on the CSPA side, we do a lot at RPM and the Community of Practice Day which is same time as the workshops the day before RPM. We're always looking for people who are interested in presenting as well as attending. Uh, we're also working with some of our partner organizations or, or uh, other organizations in the field. For example, we're working with the CIA and the SOA on offering a joint predictive analytics uh, seminar day in Toronto in February. So we're doing all sorts of exciting things and, and uh, we'd appreciate your participation or interest. Any, any closing remarks? Any other questions? So on the CAT credential, um, did you, it kind of seemed like maybe it's geared more towards someone that's actually in CAT modeling. Would you say that's true? Like I, I work with CAT modelers because we have a specific team for them, but I, I do a lot more on just the CAT risk and the capacity that we should set for that sort of stuff. So I just didn't know like how much I need to get into the actual cap modeling and work, uh, or how that would uh, work. So I'd say it, it's sort of designed around, is this? It's on? Okay, it's designed around kind of the whole, you know, ecosystem. It's certainly fair to say that um, the, the, the clearest sort of application is to, is to cap modelers, right? That they, um, especially new cap modelers coming in, the idea that there's a credential that they can drive towards that, that, you know, is external validation of what they've learned, we think is going to be very useful both to them and to employers. And, and that was also part of the logic of having the two-tier approach there. But we think it's also going to be useful for underwriters, risk managers, any, anybody who sort of interacts with cap model output to understand, okay, what's gone into, you know, how's, how's this cookie been baked, as it were? How do I interpret the, uh, the outputs and so forth? So it's not gonna be just restricted to cat modelers, but I, I would say it's fair to say that they, they're, it, it's the perfect fit for them. And I think it's, but it will also add value kind of around the edge of the uh, ecosystem as well. Okay, kind of the, the vision, the, the vision of ICAS itself was not necessarily to create uh, groups of people with designations, but basically the communities of interest, right? So if you, if you weren't a CAT modeler, but you're interested in the output of CAT models and, and seeing how that's developed, then you would join the community of practice for, for yeah. CAT, CAT management. Mm -hmm. Any other questions? Going once? going twice. Okay, thank you very much for your attention. We appreciate it. Please make sure that you fill out your evaluations either on the app or when you get the email later today. And if you check into the session on your meeting app, you will get a badge. Thanks.